Wounds in His Grip with Dr. Chuck Betters of Mark Inc. Ministries. Today we continue with the message from our archives titled, The Great White Throne, from the series, Unveiling and Understanding Revelation. Each In His Grip message is designed to help turn your heart towards Jesus and to equip you to walk by faith. Let's join Dr. Betters in the sanctuary. So the Apostle Paul comes to that 13th chapter, that great love chapter where he says that love is to be the measure or the tempered, the temperature, the, the thermometer of everything else that you do in the church. But notice a key phrase in verse 9. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. You say, what does that mean? That means prior to the completion of the New Testament canon, all that the Christians had was the Old Testament. The Bible was incomplete. So how did God give revelation to congregations in, the, in that early first century? Well, the Spirit of God would speak through the prophets and through those who had the gift of knowledge. And in the assembly, the missionaries and evangelists and the spiritual leaders would receive a word from the Lord. And God was developing an oral tradition of truth while the scriptures were being completed. But now he tells us when the perfect comes, when perfection comes, all those other gifts are going to disappear. And they did. There was no longer any need for a prophet in the church to stand up and declare the whole counsel of God. When the canon was completed, all that we ever needed to know about prophecy was put in writing. When the circulars and the encyclicals were formulated and the New Testament as we know it today was brought into fashion, the perfection had come. No longer did God need to send His Holy Spirit into the assembly to speak to somebody directly. And then they would stand up and speak in the languages that others would understand and someone else would interpret. No longer was that needed. And when the New Testament canon closed, those supernatural gifts ended. And still we have people today claiming further revelation and further truth beyond the Scriptures. Now you say, what's this have to do with the binding of Satan? Well, listen carefully. If this is perfection, if this is God's standard perfection, if what we have here in these 66 books is the whole counsel of God, if what we have in this book is all of the knowledge that you need or I need to absolutely and completely, day by day, moment by moment, and second by second, defeat Satan, then how is it that we spend so little time studying this book? Satan has been bound because God has given to us the fullness of his revealed word, Everything that God wants us to know at this present time, he's put into this book. Everything that's in this book, everything written in these books, are for your benefit and my benefit. Everything in Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. You say, why am I always living a defeated life? Why does Satan always have victory over me? Why do I do the things that I do? How come when I do the things that I do, I know they're wrong, but I go ahead and do them anyhow? How come? Because you're not insulated with the Word. You haven't built up the strength by the counsel of God and by the counsel of His Word. That's why the psalmist, did you know that the first psalm that opens the whole book of Psalms tells you that if you want to be a success in this life, you must meditate on this book day and night. You can never be a successful Christian, not in the sense that God intended it, unless you are willing to meditate in this book day and night. Meditation means you don't just occasionally open this book, dust it off, blow the dust out of the pages, and open it up just kind of like uh, fingering through it and hoping that God will just you know, instantly give you some sort of gratification. 
Meditation means that you take the words and you meditate on them, you roll them around, you apply them to your life. You begin to pray that God would use those words to give you instruction so that you can go and map a strategy to overcome the various temptations that you're facing. What do we do? We play first aid with the Bible. We use it only when we're in trouble, only when we've been wounded. There's no insulation. We haven't built up any reservoir, any strength. And every day we face temptations and we're defeated again and again and again. Do we need any other example other than the Lord Jesus Christ who when faced with Satan, what did he do? Did he call the pastor? When he was face to face with the devil, what did he do? Did he try to reason with him? Did he exchange? Did he have a dialogue with him? When Satan pulled out all the half-truths of Scripture, and that's exactly what they were, half-truths. Part of it was true, part of it wasn't true. The Spirit of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he was being tempted by Satan, he had meditated in the Word of God, he knew the Word of God, and what he used to defeat Satan was Scripture. Scripture! Maybe on Sundays we use the Bible. Maybe. Maybe we'll open the Bibles on Sundays. Maybe if the preacher turns us to a few verses, we'll open. How many of you spent, don't raise your hands, how many of you this past week spent five minutes a day in the Word? Just five. Just five. When I read about the latest Gallup poll that tells us that our kids spend six hours hours a day watching TV. A day watching TV. And their moms and their dads cannot spend five lousy minutes a day in the Word of God. Now, I didn't say, did you read the Daily Bread or the Upper Room? I didn't ask you that. I didn't ask if you read somebody else's material. What I asked you is, did you spend five minutes a day in the Word of God? Just five. How can we expect to see Satan bound in our lives if we do not insulate ourselves with the Word of God? The perfect has come. Now go over to Matthew 18. I'll give you one final reason why I believe Satan has been bound. Matthew chapter 18, in the context of the church discipline passage, He has just talked about in verses 15 through 17 the procedure that the church is to follow to discipline wayward offenders. And then he tells us in verse 18 the reasons behind it. Matthew 18, verse 18, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Notice now he's talking about the location of his kingdom as being in two places. You who are on earth and you who are in heaven. There's a binding and a loosing that is going on between the kingdom of God in heaven and the kingdom of God on earth. You know what's happening? Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Here is the principle. Satan is bound because the invisible church in heaven and the invisible church on earth are gradually becoming one kingdom. They're not two kingdoms. They're two locations. One's in heaven and one's on earth, but it's the kingdom of God. And what's happening is as we progress in time, the kingdom in heaven and the kingdom in earth, on earth are becoming one so that by the time the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and consummates all of history, the kingdom of God in heaven and the kingdom of God on earth will become one kingdom. And Satan knows that. You see, we are the Glasgow Reformed Presbyterian Church. And here we are as we sit here. We are a local organism, a local extension of the kingdom of God on earth. But I would venture to say that sitting here right now are people who do not know Jesus Christ. You may belong to the organic 
kingdom called the Glasgow Reformed Presbyterian Church, which is an extension of the kingdom of God on earth. And you may even enjoy some of the blessings that come from being a citizen of the kingdom. But I'm not foolish enough to believe, nor should you be, that everybody sitting here has really personally come to faith in Jesus Christ. There will be many who will stand in that day before God and claim citizenship who never came to faith in Jesus Christ, and they're just as lost as the devil. I've maintained for years that the hardest people in the world to reach are not those who are lost and know that they're lost, but the hardest people in the world to reach are those that are lost and think they're saved. People who think they're Christians, who think they have come to faith in Christ, but never really have trusted the Christ of the Bible, but believe they have. What a surprise it will be in that day. But you see, the kingdom of God in heaven and the kingdom of God on earth gradually become one. Well, as you read verses, go back to Revelation now and look with me at chapter 20. As you read verses 4 through 6, you're going to see the king, the king reigns and the citizens of the kingdom reign. He says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. I say, what's all this first resurrection, second resurrection, first death, second death, all this other stuff? It's not that hard. It's not that hard at all. Just like there is a birth and a new birth, you are born physically, you are born spiritually. There is a first resurrection and a second resurrection. The first resurrection occurs when every saint dies. If you were to die in the next five minutes and you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you would be spiritually resurrected. Your soul spirit would leave your body and it would immediately go into the presence of God. Immediately you would go to heaven. You have been resurrected. That's the first resurrection. Now the second resurrection comes at the end of time when the bodies are brought out of the graves and God glorifies the body and brings that soul spirit and that body together. That's the second resurrection. Now the first death is when you die physically. That's the first death. The second death is when you stand before God without knowing Jesus Christ and you're cast into hell forever and ever. The terms aren't that hard. The kingdom of God is where the saints are. It is where the thrones are. It is where the martyrs are. They're called the souls, you see in that verse. They're called the souls of those who were beheaded because their bodies have not yet been resurrected. Their bodies, the bodies of the martyrs are still in the graves. That's why they're called the souls of those who were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. The kingdom of God is where King Jesus is. Remember when he taught his disciples to pray? They asked him, how, teach us how to pray. What did he say? He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Immediate, present verb. Meaning thy kingdom come right now. Right now. When does the kingdom of God come? The kingdom of God comes every time a lost sinner comes to faith in Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God comes. The kingdom of God comes every time every one of you who know Jesus Christ make a fresh commitment of your life to him. The kingdom comes. When you make that commitment, you finally stand up and say, I'm tired of living a mediocre Christian life. 
I'm tired of second-rate citizenship as a child of God. I'm tired of the fact that I'm not using my gifts, talents, and abilities to serve the Lord. I'm tired of the sins that I continue to face in my life. I'm tired of being a failure as a believer. I'm tired of not spending time in the Word. I'm tired of a rotten marriage. I'm tired of having my children in disobedience to me. I'm tired of these things. And Lord, I come to you and I throw myself at your mercy and I make a fresh commitment of my life to you and I vow from this point on to live a life that is spiritual, a life that is a blessing to the kingdom, a life that transforms my life into that which pleases the Lord. Every time you do that, the kingdom of God comes. And ultimately, the kingdom of God will come when the Lord Jesus Christ brings the saints who are in heaven in that part of the kingdom and raises the dead and brings that resurrection to fruition and brings the saints who are alive on this earth to meet him in the air, the kingdom will come. That's what he meant when he said, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, that's the same kingdom. It happens every time a believer dies. You notice in that verse it says, that believer comes to life. That's the first resurrection. And during that interval between the first coming and the second coming, that thousand-year reign, that, that reign of Christ, the dead in Christ reign with him in heaven. But notice verse 5, he says, the rest of the dead, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. He speaks of those who are in Christ dying they go to be with the Lord but the rest of the dead those who are lost who do not experience the first resurrection the rest of the dead are going to have to experience something else it's called the second death spiritual judgment as well as physical judgment he tells us in verse 6 and then as we read earlier, Satan is loosed for a little season. That tribulation period when the church slips into apostasy. Gog and Magog, the kingdoms of this earth, rise against the church that has already slipped into apostasy, overcomes and yes, even overtakes the church. And during that tribulation period, there will be intense suffering. But then, as Satan's end comes, as that short season ends, the Lord Jesus Christ will come back, and he will defeat Satan and the Antichrist and the beast out of the land and the beast out of the sea in Babylon as he comes in glory and defeats all of those enemies and brings the church into glorious triumph with him. That's why he tells us in Revelation 20 that Christ is the one who is seated on the throne. He speaks of the elements dissolving. He speaks of the earth dissolving and being recreated and restored. He speaks of the fact that we are delivered from the bondage of corruption, that all the dead are brought up to stand before the great white throne. All the dead. Every man, every woman, every child who's ever lived will stand before that throne of judgment. Every one of us. And the books will be opened. But you see, God keeps two sets of books. Two sets of books. Over here, he has a set of books that are simply called the books. And in those books are the names of every person every man, woman, or child who has never come to faith in Christ. And he opens those books at that white throne judgment, and he shows them the opportunities they had to come to faith in Christ. And he brings the law in. Remember what I talked about the law? And he measures them by that law, and they are found guilty. And they are cast forever into the lake of fire. But then he has a second set of books, called the Book of Life. And whose names are written in the Book of Life? Those whom the Father chose before the foundation of the world. Those of you who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. 
And there as we stand before him at that great white throne, he opens the book of life and shows that the sins of your life, guilty as you are, have been moved from your head to the head of Christ. That's when he turns and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Not because you've done any good deeds, but because you've trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord. You see, friends, the whole climax of the book centers around the one and the only resurrection that will occur when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back the dead in Christ will rise and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air and there shall we ever be with the Lord forever and ever that's the blessed hope of the church that's the joy of what it means to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord you know, I want to close with a little story. There was a uh, Methodist evangelist, <coughs> and he was involved with some other people. His name was Grant Toller. He was involved with these people in a camp meeting. And uh, this particular preacher, as most preachers are, loved his food, loved to eat. One thing in particular he loved was grape jelly. And uh, at the hostess' home between services, he sat down at the table and it was, not, uh, it was not a secret that he was a lover of grape jelly. And as he sat down to eat, they noticed there was a little plate of grape jelly there, about seven or eight people at the table, but only a little bit of grape jelly. And one by one, they passed it around the table. And nobody took any of the grape jelly knowing that the preacher who was last in the circle loved grape jelly. And in deference to him, they saved it till the very end. And he sat there and he looked at that grape jelly and he said, all this is for me. And immediately the Spirit of God took a hold of this man. You see, that's how this man operated. God would use certain circumstances in his life to jolt him to do things for the Lord. So he would stand up. He stood up at that point after seeing that grape jelly and saying, all for me. And he went over to the piano and concocted a tune. He sat down at the piano and concocted a tune built around the words, all for me the Savior suffered. All for me he bled and died, but never really finished it. He did finish the tune, but not the lyrics. The pastor asked him if he would mind if he sang that song at the service that night. And he did. But the very next day, while he was getting ready to leave, while he was getting ready to go on to his next uh, appointment, a letter came to him from a woman whose name was Carrie Breck. And Carrie Breck was a mother of five children who spent all of her, quote, spare time raising five children, writing poetry. She was a very gifted writer and disciplined herself to write and write and write and write. A committed, long-life Presbyterian sent a letter to this Methodist preacher. She wrote more than 2,000 poems in her life. And she left the account of her busy life as a mother and writer. She said, I penciled verses under all conditions over a mending basket, with a baby on my arm, and sometimes even when sweeping or washing dishes, my mind moved in poetic meter. This woman could not read music, and she could not carry a tune. She was a monotone, but God gave her the gift of poetry. And she sent to this Methodist preacher, whom she knew was a gifted composer, one of her poems. And the lyrics that she wrote fit the tune that he had written. In fact, this song was used by a team of missionaries, a missionary couple, Reverend and Mrs. R. W. Portius, who served in Shanghai and China. They were brought to the torturer's bench to be killed. The hoods were placed on their heads 
and they were set into the chair about to be decapitated because they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And hearing the rumbling that was going on around them, they folded their hands, they held each other's hands, this missionary couple, and as they heard the axe about to be swung, they began to sing the song that this Methodist preacher and this mother of five children wrote. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. The executioner dropped his sword, walked away and left them sitting there with their hoods on and their hands tied. They would later return and tell this story when they returned to Shanghai. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. All for me. All for me. Not grape jelly, friends, <laughs> but eternal life. Thank you for listening to In His Grip, a ministry of Mark Inc. We just concluded the message titled The Great White Throne from the series Unveiling and Understanding Revelation. You can download this sermon at www.markinc.org. At markinc.org, you'll find numerous free resources that offer help and hope to the hurting. You can also safely give online to help keep In His Grip on the air. Thank you in advance for your support.